Well, hello there, everybody, and welcome to a brand new edition of On to the Next One. We are live, everybody, on the MMA Fighting YouTube channel following maybe the greatest mixed martial arts event of all time from start to finish, UFC 300. I'm not even going to say it delivered. It took the word delivered, stomped a mud hole in it, and walked it dry. Because this is even better than this could have been. I don't even know what AK's gymnastics score is going to be for this card, but it had to have surpassed it. So many reactions, so many big moments. It was just a celebration of the UFC in the best possible way. And it was, it was amazing. And we're here to talk about what happened last night from a matchmaking perspective. I am Mike Heck. Apologies. I know you guys are usually used to... 10 a.m., 11 a.m., the day after doing these programs, but uh, I had to fly home. I was in Las Vegas last night. I had to fly home. So it was either not give you a show at all or do it a little bit later in the day. And damn it, we're giving it to you a little bit later in the day. But joining me in this matchmaking wonderfulness following UFC 300, the co host, the co matchmaker, the prince of positivity, my best friend, Mr. UFC 300 himself, the great Alexander Kaylee. AK! The UFC did the thing last night. How are we doing? My best friend. MMA is fun. <laughs> isn't, isn't MMA fun when it's done right? Isn't MMA fun when it's done? Like, I know I know people have this idea of us in the media as being jaded and, oh, we're complaining about all these Apex cards we have to cover. Oh, woe is us. You know, how unfortunate for us. But listen, we, we sometimes we have valid complaints. That we're, we're never going to stop uh, reporting on, you know, weaker cards and uh, you know, fighter pay should be better and oh, what the what what Bellator and PFL could be doing better and all that stuff there's there's CD there's parts of this uh you know business that got to be reported on but man when it comes to fight night when it comes to the UFC's ability to put on the best cards the best shows create the biggest moments I mean nothing beats it you know nothing beats it and you have a card like UFC 300 which on paper at the very least, I think the deepest card in MMA history. I, I, I don't, you know, you don't have to say best. You don't have to agree with best, but deepest, I, you, you'll be hard pressed to, to, to match this. Uh, and the UFC itself will be hard to press to match this the next time they decide to do it, whether it's UFC 350 or 400 or we're celebrating, you know, like a 30th anniversary, or whatever. Um, it'll be hard to beat it. Uh, it'll be hard to beat it. And, and uh, it flew by, Mike. You know, we had to cover it for work, and this isn't always the case. Sometimes we have cards. You get into that. You were on live a live watch party for over seven friggin' hours. Seven and a half hours. We always say, like, you know, Daniel Cormier, John Anik, Joe Rogan, all those guys that do that. Like, it's tough for them, right? It's tough for them. They're in the arena. Them having to talk from the prelims all the way to the final. Like, imagine how hard it is for them. And, and you guys had – you and, and Connor Burks and, and, and uh, whatever guests you had, you know, had to do the same thing. So, it is tough, man. It is tough. And But this was a pleasure. Um those of us, you know, who were just working at the desk, just working on cranking out stories, cranking out blogs, cranking out video on MMAfighting.com. It was a pleasure. It flew by. I didn't want the card to end. Um, but, I mean, the way it did end was spectacular. The moments just all – there's something to talk about in every fight. Every fight has a story. It was a great moment, man. It was a great time to be a fight fan. So to uh, Dana White and company, of course, all the staff and the crew, like the UFC that make this stuff happen, ESPN, uh, bravo. And the fighters, of course, the fighters, their coaches, their teams. Bravo! This was a, an unbelievable show. Yes, it truly was a pleasure, comma man. It was a pleasure, shout comma out. man. Yeah. <laughs> shout out to Anton uh, Chakali. <laughs> uh, this is what we're gonna do, everybody. AK and I, we're gonna go through our picks. Normally, we would do main event, co-main event, all the title fights. We would do the winner and the loser, but we're not gonna do that today. We're not doing the, any of the losing fighters unless because there is no wild card. So if you guys want to match make for the losing fighters, we could certainly do that. Is there a chance perhaps a losing fighter will be matched up with somebody else that competes on this card? We will find out, but we're just going to work. And we're not just doing the main card. We're doing every winner from last night's card, every single winner. And then after we go through that, we will go to you guys. We'll do a little rapid fire wild card round and you guys can throw in your picks. Uh, and if we talk about a specific fight or a specific fighter, Leave some comments. We'll pull them up on the screen and we'll do the damn thing. So let's get into this, AK. Let's get into this thing. Uh, shout out to Zeno. Max KO puts him on another level. We're about to talk about where Max Holloway is going to go because that man has a lot of options. But let's talk about Alex Pereira. Poetan goes in there, absolutely melts Jamal Hill. And one of the funniest moments we've ever seen. And I'm... And I say this because 
There was the kick to the ding ding. Herb Dean was going to stop it. Alex Pereira was like, nah, dude, get out of here. And just like nudged him ever so gently out of the way and then knocked him, Jamal Hill, out bad. Like that was a bad knockout. I saw people on Twitter say it was an early stoppage. I, how, how could you even say that? Jamal Hill's eyes rolled in the back of his head. And those hammer fists, like the way Jamal Hill like looked at Alex Pereira, that was one of the coldest photos you'll ever see of Pereira doing the meme celebration and Hill just looking up in them wide eyed, like what the hell just happened? But Alex Pereira just continues to break MMA, break the rankings as we know it. And AK gets on the mic. The thing he wanted to do was, I want to fight at 301. I think Alex knew. He, this is basically Alex saying, I'm not fighting Magomed ankle live in Brazil. I'm just not doing it. I don't want to. I just fought Jamal Hill. So I'm going to fight a dude at heavyweight. So maybe you give him that AK. But what are we doing here? What is the official on to the next one selection for Alex Pereira after another incredible performance? Uh, it's fun, as uh, Shane Alshadi always puts it, to see Alex Pereira speed run his way to history. You know, just winning titles left and right with so little... Uh, MMA experience, in cage MMA experience. Of course, a lot of combat sports experience. Everyone knows, great, great kickboxer, two division champion over in Glory before coming to uh, really fully committing to MMA. So seeing him go for the heavyweight title would be hilarious. It would be fun. And, and he didn't say Tom Aspinall, by the way. He didn't say Tom Aspinall. He said he wants to fight a heavyweight. He said he's. I'm not going to name names, but you know whatever the UFC can give me, that's that's something he'd be interested in doing. I, it's a cool idea. I have no problem with it. I think it'd be super fun to see him beat up, uh, God forbid, Parker Porter in Brazil or something like that. But uh, I, I'm, I'm booking with wanting him to stay at light heavyweight, wanting him to build his legacy there first. Um, his legacy right now, I get, is one of a kind. Maybe he's not the kind of guy who we need to see to rattle off, you know, three or four tall defenses of heavyweight. Um, it, it might not matter for him. Maybe Pereira's legacy should be the guy who won UFC titles in three divisions. As you know, not that's an easy thing to do. I, I think if he fights Tom Aspinall, I think Aspinall will be heavily favored. Um, but I went away from saying again, booking him against like Chris Barnett or Jairzinho or whatever at heavyweight. Um, it could happen, but I'm sticking at 205. I do want to see the Angolaya fight, so maybe I'm waving my magic wand here. Maybe this isn't a crystal ball pick because. Like you said, Alex Pereira's team doesn't seem to have any interest. I don't think they even mentioned him. Or I don't even think he was even asked about Magomed and Goliath. Um, So other than the tweets that are coming from uh, accounts that are, of course, managed by uh, a certain notorious MMA manager, I don't know how many people were talking about Ankalaev Pereira, but the last time I matched with Frank Goliath, I believe I did stick with Pereira, and I don't see any reason to deviate from that now. So people, you can boo me. Maybe not the sexiest fight right now. But Ankalaya, how can you say he's not? He has not earned this title shot. So uh, Yuri is certainly an option, but I don't think we need to run back Yuri and Alex just yet. So yes, guys, I'm going with the quote unquote deserving. You know, again, a word we don't really use in MMA matchmaking. A deserving uh, challenger in uh, in uh, Megaman and Kalaya. Yeah, like th that is that should be the guy, right? That should be the guy for Alex Pereira's next light heavyweight title defense. But you know what, AK? You said it earlier, and I'm just going to double down on it. MMA is supposed to be fun. Alex Pereira is about as fun as you can be right now. And if this man wants to fight at heavyweight, let him fight at heavyweight. The correct answer to this is just throw him in there with any warm body, like literally any heavyweight. If anybody wants to step up and fight Alex Pereira in Brazil, like just put him on the card. It does not matter. But... You talked about how good UFC 300 was, and we trudged through some just sludgy, slow, bad Apex cards, just really terrible, but it was all sort of worth it with UFC 300, and then we're in such good moods, we were watching great fights and great performances, and then the UFC would put up a schedule, a graphic of Nicolau versus Alex Perez about to headline at the Apex on their next card, and we're just like, oh God. And then it's UFC 301 with Ali Pants versus Vincenzo Urseg as the right now main event of a pay-per-view. And then it's, what's the next one? Is it St. Louis after that with Derek Lewis and Rodrigo Nascimento? And then it's back to the world's most famous Apex for another fight that I can't even remember at this point. So 
301 needs a boost. I think May needs a boost, like real bad. I think we got to do something a little bit fun here. Uh, so this is what we should do, AK. That St. Louis main event is trash. That is a tough main event. Tell us how you really Nascimento. feel, my best friend. Tell us how you really feel. My goodness. Rodrigo, Rodrigo Nascimento is on a nice little run, but he is not main event ready. He just isn't, and St. Louis deserves better. And if St. Louis demands Joaquin Buckley to fight in the main event, fine. I don't at this point, maybe he was smart to, to time it. What I would do is you just tell Derek Lewis, hey, we're gonna give you a little bit of a paycheck here. You go ahead and now you don't have to fight Rodrigo Nascimento. Now you don't have to worry about getting tackled and put on your back for 25 minutes. We're gonna send you to Brazil, give you a whole bunch more money, and you can fight Alex Pereira in the co-main event, and you two could just slug it out until somebody falls. Like that's just fun. You just push a Derek Lewis up two weeks. You think he cares? You think he cares? This is a way bigger fight. Pay him more money. It does not oh. matter. Throw him in there with Derek Lewis. Let's do the fun thing. Let's just do the fun thing. And then Ankle Live can get his title shot after. It's My all best good. friend, they have a schedule. You can't just pull fighters willy nilly out of fights and put them into better sure fights. Sure, you can. You, you cannot. We have rules. We have rules and regulations. We have contracts signed. This is a business that they're running here. How can Dude, you? How can you say Rodrigo such a thing? Just chuck Rodrigo Nascimento in Brazil too. Throw him against anybody. Rebel, you know what? You know what? You're right, AK. You're right. Maybe we'll go a different direction. We'll pull Rebellus to Spain from St. Louis, and he could fight Alex Pereira at UFC 301. Who's Rebellus fighting again? Waldo Cortez Acosta. Oh yeah, yes, yeah, you hated that matchup. Mike, there is some child out there, some young lad <laughs> who is going to their first <laughs> UFC event in St. Louis. And they are looking starry-eyed, looking at that card every day, going like, oh, "I can't wait to see Lewis fight Nascimento. I can't no, wait." There's to not see, one person there is, in the there world. There is some that. young child, boy or girl out there who is like their first UFC card, looking forward to seeing Robles to Spain and Waldo Cortez Acosta. And you are trying to take that away from them. Uh, we are friends, so I know you are doing this with the best of intentions. But I'm just telling you. You, you, be, you have to be careful with your power. You're a very influential man in the MMA media, Mike. You know that. You could make this actually happen. You could be speaking this into existence. I mean, did you see what happened after... What, what did I say on Heck of Morning after UFC 299? UFC 301 should be Isla Makachev versus Dustin Poirier, and then the five-round co-main event should be Paul Costa wow. versus Sean Strickland. Wow. Look at what they did last night. Look at what they did last night. But wow. I digress. That's These, how I do. Just do the fun thing. The correct answer is Pereira versus any heavyweight in the world. It does not matter. Put him on that card. Make him look like a superstar. Let him knock somebody dead, and then we can move on to the next thing. He's Perfect. so good. He's so fun. I he so makes fun. no sense. I'm gonna say the word "fun" a lot, but I apologize, guys. You, you, you have a drinking it's a game. Fun. It was fun. I that card was so enjoyable. I, 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 I'm, I know we've probably waxed poetic about enough on post fight shows, and you guys listen. To, you guys will be listening to a million podcasts where media members and fans and everyone will just be gushing over this card, and it's all, it's all deserving. Like it's all deserving. They, they, they knocked out of the park. Speaking of knocking out of the park, uh, Zhang Wei Li knocked it out of the park. Fun fight mm -hmm. with Yan Zhonan. I actually, while I was at the airport, I went back and rewatched the fight because I thought I, I, I remember obviously watch, doing the watch party and I thought it was a fun, enjoyable fight. It just happened to follow the craziest ending in a crazy battle that like I've ever seen. It's just been crazy. So this is a good fight. Even in a vacuum, it was a great fight. Zhang Wei Li won. I thought she won four rounds to one. Great performance from her. It was kind of weird at the end of the first round because I thought she put Yan Zhen on to sleep, which she kind of did, but she at least was able to get up and, and run back to her corner with the help of her team. But Zhang Wei Li is just so damn good at this. She's our number one women's pound for pound fighter for a reason. She will remain there. And this is just too easy, man. Like, I don't even care if it takes another nine months. Zhang Wei Li shall not enter the octagon again until Tatiana Suarez is ready. This is, I mean, this is the fight. Can we kill the I, band? No, that's it's because who else is there? Mike, they I mean, haven't gotten to play in like three, in like a month. It's too easy though. <laughs> if we, there's some, there's some. I feel like a lot of these are too easy, but there are some certain ones. But yeah, mm. dude, it's Tatiana Suarez. That is the fight. You know that's it. I know it. Fight. And plus, I knew you were gonna go there anyways because. Yeah. You said it after Tatiana's last win. Like, let's go. I'm ready to go now. Yep. We, I, I love me some Yan Shonan, but 
I want to see Tatiana fight now. That's what you said. So I knew you were going there anyways. It's such a good fight. It's such a good fight. And I need to see it. I need, and, and I don't even say this. I think there's some people who want to see it for Tatiana. Like Tatiana is going to steamroll Zhang. Like I don't, and, and maybe after yesterday, seeing how, how well Yan did against her, maybe that, that those voices are getting even louder. Like there's like, Oh, if, if, if Zhang like couldn't run through um, Yan Shana and she won what 49, 45s across the board. Right. So like she it was a pretty like convincing victory. She did get knocked oh, down yeah. once, knocked down once, probably rocked pretty badly another time. I think that wasn't counted a knockdown. Um, but again, that to me says that 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 fight honestly, uh, you know, I, we said this week we're not doing the the losers of the title fights, um, of the top three fights, and normally we would. It's just again we want to dedicate time to all the winners on this card. It was so packed. But Yan Shanan, uh, I think Yan Shanan is just really good. I think Yan Shanan is so much better than people th thought. I thought she really, or I think the, the loss to Esparza, the way she got mauled, kind of put like a permanent mark on her that like, it was just, oh, she's not a world title contender. It's like, listen, that just wasn't her night. It wasn't a good style matchup. And Carlos Esparza, I also think is very good. So uh, Jan did, I thought, performed well. Zhang is just, is just that damn good. But man, what a legacy builder that would be if she could beat Tatiana. I mean, you're talking about Zhang as one of the top three like best women's fighter. If you aren't already, you're talking about Zhang as one of the top three best women's fighters of all time. And um, there's always been a weird MMA math going because of the Rose fights. But other than that, damn, man, if she beats Tatiana, I, I can't even, I need to see that fight now, Mike. I need it now. See, we don't need to cue the band. Oh, so, band, I'm sorry. Mike, they want to play so badly, Mike. I know. It's all good. Let's talk about the hero, the MVP of UFC 300. His name is Max Holloway. The new BMF champion. I I don't I don't even know what to say about this AK. This was an incredible pillar to post beatdown from Max Holloway. Yes, Justin Gaethje won the fourth round, in my opinion, but this is all Max Holloway. All Max Holloway. You've never seen Justin Gaethje question himself in a fight. Like he still sort of battles through those questions and still just does Justin Gaethje things. It took Justin Gaethje till the fourth round, as they talked about on the post-fight show, to throw a jab. And then once he started throwing jabs, like he got a little, he had a little bit more success. But then the final 10 seconds of the fight is going to live on with us forever. They, he does, Max Holloway points to the canvas, does the Ricardo Lamas thing, circa UFC 199. They're slugging away, both are throwing big punches. And then Max Holloway lands the right hand from hell. And Justin Gaethje, in a way we've never seen him before, unconscious, face down on the mat, a bloody mess, and Max Holloway is getting his flowers. It was like Stone Cold Steve Austin coming out in Worcester Mass to help Mick Foley win the WWF title. The crowd just lost their minds. What a moment it was. And now, AK, Max Holloway has options for days. He's has a case to be the number one contender for the lightweight title right now. He has a case to be the number one contender for the featherweight title right now. Oh, yeah, and he's in play to fight the likes of the of the Conor McGregor's and the Michael Chandler's. Basically, whatever this man wants to do, the UFC could probably pull it off. So I would assume title fight is coming his way in your eyes. Maybe I'm wrong about this. I don't like to make assumptions, but which title, AK? Are we going 155 or 145 after this performance? Yeah, man. Blessed, blessed man forever as he has now redubbed the belt as he is, as he is allowed to do, as is his right. Um, that ending, sorry, before I get to the pick, that ending uh, is, if you would put it in a movie, we would have rolled, like you would roll your eyes. If this was uh, Roadhouse 2, Back to the Cage, and uh, uh, Elwood Dalton, you know, if he if he won a fight <laughs> like that, where it's like, oh yeah, they did a big flurry and he beats him with a, but you'd, you'd be like, that's stupid. Like that wouldn't happen in a real, fight. especially especially in a situation like this where Max was up on the cards. But uh, sometimes real life is stranger than fiction, and sometimes you have larger than life characters like Max Holloway and Justin Gaethje, and these things happen. It was just, it was so beautiful, and um, I've watched it a million times. I'm sure everyone, the UFC. By the way, again, I I can't believe I'm praising the UFC so much, guys. I'm going to be called a UFC shill after this after being called by a UFC hater for like for for years. Um, they did a brilliant job, like they did with the O'Malley Sterling finish. They put that knockout sequence on all of their socials after uh, they put it on their, I don't know if they put it on their Twitter, but it was on their Instagram. I think it was on their TikTok. Dana White put it out later to make sure. So people, anyone who didn't tune into the pay-per-view, guess what? And you're just looking for UFC 300 highlights. You could see that knockout, one of the greatest moments in UFC history. I think it's on YouTube as well. I want to say, I think they isolated the highlights just for YouTube. And the UFC, listen, not every promotion can do this, but the UFC can do this. They can take big peer view moments and give them away for free. And guess what? It helps their brand grow even more and just preserves these moments forever. So great job there. Uh, yes, title fight. 
it's weird. I had never, even though there had been a lot of talk between Holloway and uh, Elio Toporia, like some, some you know, snipes and jabs. Uh, Holloway was asked about him quite a bit during fight week, and he had some answers prepared to talk about the Toporia situation. In my mind, I, it's weird. I just never thought about him going back down and getting that shot. Um, but yeah, that's the way to go, man. That's the way to go. Tapuri was in the audience. Even he looked kind of like, wow, that was a hell of a knockout. Uh, <laughs> it's his reaction. It was a little hard to play it cool, but holy crap. How can you play it cool when that happens? Everyone's freaking out around you. Uh, it's the way to go. Holloway, I like the way he's kind of sold the fight. He hasn't downplayed Tapuri at all. He's just said, look, I beat up all the contenders. The UFC sent contenders to me. I beat them up before they can even get to Volkanovski. Somehow Tapuri skipped that line, didn't have to fight me. Well, we can write that wrong. You know, we can, he's got the belt. They need a big name to fight him. Tapura certainly has options. And, and, and I am breaking my own rule here because I had picked Mosar. Mosar is not booked right now. He's still free. Theoretically, he should get the title shot. But if you think that the matchmakers, if they have a choice, are picking between Mosar and Holloway right now, man, I'm sorry, Floyd. I think the guy is so great. I think he could be the world champion. He's going to get skipped over if, uh, if Holloway has his way. So, uh, Elia needs a top opponent, man. Needs a name, and it it is Max Holloway. So give me that featherweight title fight next. We're forgetting Volkanovski here, who definitely has a case of his own. Sorry, yeah, guys. And, I, I know. Spot. and he's beaten Max three be... times. He's beaten Max three times. I mean, really, he has every right yeah. to his rematch. But I don't know. Yeah, I think if there is one guy who lost, if Max decides to do it at forty five and fight Taporia, he's gonna get it. And Volk's gonna have to wait, which maybe not be the worst thing in the world. Yeah, I don't even think we need to queue up the band here. It, it is Taporia. I think it's such a massive fight. Although Max Holloway versus Islam Makachev would be really fascinating. But I think this all sort of works out, and we're gonna talk about this in a moment. But yeah, Holloway Taporia is a massive fight. I know a lot of people are talking about Spain. I would be stunned if the UFC gets to Spain in 2024. I could see it happening maybe in the first half of 2025, it's not easy. You can't, like, I don't care who you are. Even the UFC who is on fire right now, you can't just be like, hey, Spain, I want to rent out the stadium. Oh, what date? Of course, it's right here. Whatever you want. No, there's shit happening there all the time. So you have to wait and, and kind of see how it plays out, especially when you're getting into a market like that. So, but Max Holly versus Ilya Taporia, literally anywhere is a huge fight. It's a massive fight. Max is a big friggin' star. He's even bigger than ever after creating one of the greatest moments we've ever seen in the sport. That is a Baba O'Reilly moment. We will be thinking about this moment and we will, when we do a damn, they were good. When we do a UFC three, right before UFC 400, we do, we do the UFC 300 rewatch party. We're going to talk about what we we're doing. The exact moment, that moment that that knockout happened when Max clipped him at the buzzer. Just incredible shit, man. Shout out to Max Holloway. Guys, so many people buried. And so many people, when this fight was announced, it's like, oh, Max is going to get killed. He's going to get run over. What the hell are we doing here? And then Max just made us all believe again. But And I had a bet on Max Holloway, so I was very happy with the way that played out. Plus five <laughs> and a half points. Let's well played. Go. Yes, that was a very, uh, I needed that one. And Zhang Wei Li, they're my two heroes. Had a winning week because of them. Let's go to Armin Saruki at AK. He had multiple fights on Saturday. Not just with Charles Oliveira, the former champion, but someone in the crowd decided to take some shots at him, and he threw a punch at somebody, which go to MMAfighting.com and get the full breakdown of that. Dana White's reaction to it. Has a good scrap of Charles Oliveira. I thought Armin fought incredible. He made two mistakes in the fight, and they cost him almost cost him the fight. Uh, once in the first round with the, the ghillie that looked real nasty, and then once again in the third round where Charles Oliveira is going for that kind of nasty arm triangle and Sarukian was able to, to get it done. I scored the fight 29, 28 for Sarukian on the rewatch watching it live. It was just sort of like, yeah, I guess it's 30, 27 Armin, but I wasn't married to that at all. I just ended that feeling like Armin won. And to me, because of how this is all going to play out, this is a huge win. You go and you beat Benny Darius, knock him cold. And then you beat Charles Oliveira in a fist fight. Through 15 minutes, the full way. I would have loved to have seen 10 more minutes of that fight, but we couldn't get it. You should be fighting for the belt. That's it. And that's exactly what he's going to be doing, AK. And we're going to get Max Holloway versus Silly Taporia. We're going to get Dustin Poirier getting his title shot in June. I know a lot of people are excited about that. It's going to be Dustin's last chance to fight for Undisputed Gold. And then, AK, the chance for my prediction 
is going to come true. We're going to have a chance to make this come true. That at the end of the year, Armin Sarukin, as it's printed on MMAfighting.com, terrific website, will be the lightweight champion of the world, per my prediction. And they're going to do it in Abu Dhabi in October after Islam beats Dustin Poirier because that's probably what's going to happen, although the sport is super weird. But <laughs> it doesn't matter who wins that fight because Armin Sarukin is fighting the winner, and it's just the way it should be, especially if Islam Makachev wins. What a freaking fight. The rematch between those two guys is just going to be incredible. So, like you like to say, let's do it. Let's just do it now. Let's not wait. We can't do it now, but let's do it in October, right around Halloween time. Your thoughts. Mike, can we can we let the band play? That's three in a row. Can we let the band play? Is it two? Are they? I mean, who else? Who else is he gonna fight? <laughs> I who else is he going to fight? I, that's fine. Is he gonna fight Bobby Green? What is he how, gonna... <laughs> how often do we get three in a row? Can we let the band play? The band is is like they're they're like we don't pay people don't know, we don't pay the 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 uh, no band unless they play. They they they're they're starving right now. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll, we'll do it for this one, even though it was the most obvious pick. Three in one, a row. Two. Three, two, one. Friends, Friends forever. forever. We've done it. Aaron Sarukian versus the champion of the universe. That's what we do. Uh, what we yeah. Do. yeah. Uh, Unless it, Max Holloway calls for the lightweight title and then Armin screwed. It, yeah, true. It couldn't have worked out better uh, that, that having that fight announced that night because it gives us such a clear timing for when Armin... Because Armin, that was a tough fight. He needs time off. Like he's not. He wasn't going to jump right into that uh, Islam fight whenever Islam was available. Wasn't going to happen. Now we know... Islam Poirier, if Islam wins, uh, it, you know his inactivity is a bit overplayed. I think like people saying he's inactive. He's just like there's a, it's just there's a lot of time between his fights. I think that's what annoys people. And um, I don't you know whenever Islam's ready to fight again, again it could be a long time. Armin has the luxury of time as well. So yeah, it, it the, the timing works out. Armin chill, great fight. Two two top five lightweights that he just beat. It's time, man. It's time for him to get another shot at, at Islam. Or yeah, who knows? Maybe, maybe Poirier pulls off the upset. And we get a fresh matchup. But um, yeah, that's the way to go. Uh, Armand, you can you can wait. You can afford to wait. I want to see Islam Akhshaf Armin Sarukin too. So Allah, badly. yes, yes. I want to see it so badly. Uh, Hakim the Dream Kamara versus Pereira in Brazil for the two hundred five pound belt. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't coming off like a loss, it seems like yeah. I'm sure Magomed ain't alive, but love that. Uh, and Slito wants to know is the BMF title cursed? It is yet to be defended. Huh. Okay. Let's think about this quickly. So obviously Masvidal didn't really defend it after winning it. He went from that to the first, the two Kamaru fights, right? Yes. Okay. So I mean, and, and and neither of those fights was the BMF title on the line, as it were. But I guess we're saying okay, after he won the BMF title, he lost his next two fights, uh, and now is it, what, I'm, I'm not missing. And then it's Justin's the only the second one, right? There's no Justin was the second one and he just and lost then now Max is the third. I mean, it's not a lot of sample size, but yeah, uh, winning the BMF title certainly does not uh, lead to success in their next fight. But I mean, also it usually because winning the BMF title throws you into a crazy ass, difficult fight in your next fight. So there you go. That's what we've seen with Justin and, and um, but yeah, it's certainly worth pointing out. Uh, shout out Hakeem and Slito for the super chats. Uh, much appreciated. Let's go to Bo Nickel, AK. A lot of people were not happy that he was on the main card. A lot of people still were probably a little bit less unhappy after the way that fight with Cody Brundage went, even though I went back and rewatched that fight this morning. Bo Nickel, outside of like one moment early where Cody threw a flying knee and landed a, like one punch, Bo Nickel just mauled Cody Brundage on the floor. And all Cody could do really do is just defend and not get submitted. And then eventually that happened. Like this is Bo Nichols fifth fight. It ended quickly, which is the reason he was on the main card because you just wanted you as fans who spent $80 on this card, you didn't buy it to watch Bo Nickel fight. You bought it to watch Armin Sarukin and Charles Oliveira and Max Holloway and Justin Gaethje and Zhang Wei Li and Yan Jonan and Alex Pereira versus Jamal Hill. What fight will guarantee that we will get there as quickly as possible. It is Bo Nickel fighting Cody Brundage. That's what happened. Gets it done in the second round. He wasn't happy with his performance, AK. You already know where I'm going with this, so I'll, I'll throw it to you. Um, I've been putting this out there for a while. I think it's time, but please go ahead. See if the band needs to be queued up again. No, I guess not, because I don't think we're, we're going to have the same pick here. Um, yeah, I, I would have loved to have seen Yuri or uh, Rakic or Kayla Harrison. I thought Kayla Harrison made it, but I think maybe they were worried that the Harrison home fight could be, I don't know, maybe a 
it's a women's bantamweight fight. They thought maybe it could go to an uneventful decision, maybe not the best look to start. And as you said, they were just trying to get to the sort of the, the, the top four and the meat of the card as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, no real criticism of Bo here. I mean, I think Cody, again, was that's what you should expect from a guy who's in his third UFC fight facing a guy who is pretty experienced. You know, not not maybe not the most elite talent, but an experienced guy. So I'm glad Bo was hardened himself, but he got the job done, still got the finish. Uh, six and zero now as a pro, three and zero in the UFC. Uh, you, I got a lot of ways you could go. I think I found an opponent who I would rank higher than him, but also uh, so Nick, so uh, Bo Nickel can move up if he if he wins this. But also again, not too stiff a challenge. And stylistically, I think it's an amazing matchup for him. So I'll go with uh, Jacob Malkoon. I think Jacob Malkoon's the way to go. Good grappler, uh, certainly not on the level of um, Bo Nickel. And I think uh, that's another first or second round finish for both those two run into each other. Did he just fight? Oh, that was the yeah. uh, Petrosky yeah. super weird Petrosky knocked yeah. himself out fight. Yeah, 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 yeah. On the on his hip, yeah, yeah. I don't hate that. I don't hate that. But it's time. If you want to get to the upper echelon of this division, if you want to be in the discussion to be in the upper echelon of this division, there's only one man. There's only one man that is going to answer the phone and be like, "I'm that guy." is the man who holds like all the submission records, all the grappling records at 185 pounds right now, the Wiley veteran himself, Gerald Mearshart, the Ooh. third GM three. Let's do it. Like, just do it. Let's see what he can do. I think he's ready. I, I, I mean, enough, enough is enough. We've seen Brundage was a, was a step up. He, he himself has not called out anybody, but on his post fight interview, he named Two very dangerous men, Roman Kopulov and Fluffy Hernandez. Let's, you know, let's speed walk before we sprint. Let's do Gerald Mearshart. I, I actually really like that fight too. So but let's go. Fluffy's got business to take care of himself. He's fighting Roman Delize June 1st. But, and Roman Kopulov is booked too. So technically, Bo Nickel had multiple doo doo picks in his post fight interview. But GM3 is, is available and ready to go. Uh, a lot of people were suggesting Chris Weidman for this fight. Uh, Bo Nickel was asked specifically about Chris Weidman during his media scrum, and he said he has no interest in fighting Chris Weidman. Too much respect there. So, yeah, Nickel GM3. Been planting the seeds for about a year now. It's time. It's – I think the – let me say, I think the UFC has been doing a great job with how they booked Bo, by the way. Again, I, I know people will complain he was on the main card. Maybe they thought Cody Brundage name-wise is too much of a walkover. But again, this is a guy who just – yes, a lot of combat sports experience, the, 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 the collegiate wrestling superstar. It's not the same as MMA, and it's just not the same thing. Um, so that's why it's it's such a tricky thing to book him. Like on paper, it looks so weird to me, you you matching it with, with Gerald, even though I know it, it is a good matchup. But like Gerald has 52 – pro mma fights Bo has six and it just feels wrong when you look at it that way but again you we are counting a lot of Bo's experience again outside of mma he you know there's that's how commissions look at this sort of thing otherwise they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't authorize that kind of fight so mike you might be right maybe it's time i thought you were going brad tavares a little bit there and i'm like that's kind of a no. weird matchup gm3 gosh that's a step up I mean that's a real step up, Mike. But this tells me that you have a lot of this tells me you have a lot of faith in Bo's abilities. Yeah, I think he is he's one of the most intriguing prospects I've ever seen. Because yes, definitely. I wasn't thoroughly. I mean, he was he was fine last night. Like people were saying that he sucked. I him I I think he even he was a little too hard on himself. That fight was not competitive for even a second. I mean, maybe like two seconds it was competitive. But Bo just mauled him on the floor. Cody could do nothing. He's just getting screamed at by his team. And Bo just continued to just attempt to strangle him over and over again. And Cody couldn't do a thing about it. Uh, this man's going to be a problem. And if you're Gerald Mearshart, hell, if you're any of these top 40 middleweights, top 30, 25, etc., you should all be calling for Bo Nickel. Every single one of you. Get him now. Because if you wait 18 months to fight him, he's going to kill you. Like, it's going to be real bad. So get him while the getting's going. And if you're GM3, I think you take that fight and, and make it happen. So I'm intrigued by it. And, you know, people thought GM3 was cooked after because he got put in that position against Hamza Chimaev and got 
it was it was it was a tough night for for good old GM three, but he's bounced back in a big way. So, do you, you think? Go. Do you think? I don't know why I'm pulling up this comparison, Mike, but we're here now, and there's no going back. Okay. Can Gerald become the Jim Miller of the middleweight division? Is yes. it too? Is it? I mean, is it? But I mean, can he reach like thirty? five fights or do you think it's too early he's just a little too far do you think he got to the ufc a little too late he's at 20 now i think this is i think uh, i believe his last fight was his 20th ufc fight so <laughs> halfway to go to even get close to uh jim miller but do you think he could get like end his career with, like 35 ufc fights he's lot. what he is th he's 36 yeah oh yeah dude. He, he, you think he can do it he, so, what's, so he's at what he's at 20 20, 20. 36 I mean, he's definitely gonna fight another like four years. I've known yeah, Joe for know. a for a while. I think yeah. he keeps going. He likes he likes what he's doing. That'd be interesting. That should that should be a, qu a question we have this week. Who's the next? Joe and I think he's 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 a guy that like I think people could really get into like a Jim mm -hmm. Miller because he's fun as hell, man. Like good personality, good on the stick, good fun fighter. Get or get got all star. I mean, just he's great. He's great, and I kind of want to see that fight. So. Speaking of get or get God All Star, speaking Oof. of just absolute savage, uh, Yuri Prohachka, the samurai himself, and Samurai Gate, as Sh Shad Al Shadi wrote on MMA Fighting this morning, uh, tremendous stuff. Uh, Alexander Rakic basically calling out Yuri Prohachka and saying, You're not a real samurai because you read a book. And you can immediately see Yuri Prohachka be like, Oh man, you don't know what you just did to yourself. That fight. With him and Rack, with Prohachka and Rakic was so friggin' good. It was amazing. Rakic coming back after two years, maybe had the best one, one of the best rounds of his career in the first round against Yuri Prohachka. Thumping him up, he's landing big shots, he's landing those kicks to the legs. Like Yuri Prohachka was having a hard time walking, but the whole time Yuri's just getting thumped in round one. He's just giving this man a look that like I'm going to get my time. And when it happens, you're going to be hurt. Like he just kept smiling at him. It was psycho. It was very psychotic from one Yuri Prohachka. And then round two, Yuri goes in, does exactly what his face in round one said he was going to do. I'm going to get you. And that's what he did. Yuri Prohachka is a madman. AK dude is an absolute beast. I would love to see him fight Alex Pereira again. I just don't think it's going to happen right now. So I think the fight you make is Yuri Prohashka versus the man who it could be a fight between the last two men to fight Alex Pereira at 205 pounds in championship bouts. Let's do Yuri Prohashka versus Jamal Hill oh. for the next fight. Oh, that makes sense. And there's some, there's some bad blood there too. Certainly some bad blood there. And then, and they're also part of that weird light heavyweight kerfuffle where guys had to keep vacating the title and, yeah, I guess that makes sense. I should have gone there. I think I didn't book for maybe maybe I was so intent on not booking for people who lost on Saturday that I just missed some obvious picks. Um, I I want to that your that fight was awesome. It's so weird with theory because the same strategy like this is the same strategy he employed against Alex Pereira and the same strategy that cost him the UFC light heavyweight title is what got him this incredible win on on Saturday. Like he just walks forward. His leg was getting annihilated, just chewed up, chewed up to hell that's it's not a viable like offensive strategy the way he was fighting and the way he often fights <laughs> Un unless you're him unless you're Yuri Prasha you're tough you have ridiculous finishing power this guy has not gone to the scorecards in friggin how long like I mean I got I had to quickly just jump to his uh eight year almost eight years <laughs> this guy does not go to the scorecards even the, the even the all-time classic over to sheriff we all thought that was going to the scorecards nope Nope, he pulled out a rear naked choke in the last 30 seconds of the fight. He does not go to the car. He doesn't. And for him, again, the past few years, for the most part, the, the coin toss has been in his favor. Again, except for the Alex Pereira fight. He, he has been the one giving. He's been the one getting people, not the one getting got. So it's just so fascinating to watch. Uh, I kind of went with like a stay busy fight because I do want to see him, I think, get a title fight at some point. I just don't think it's right to throw him in there. I went with Nikita Krilov. I think that's a fun fight. Uh, as Again, if you want to talk about someone getting finished, Someone's gonna get dusted, probably Nikita Krilov. So I didn't go with a bigger name. I I think the Jamal Hill pick is probably better. I, I'm sure people in the comments are, are seeing the logic in that as well. Um, 
but I went sort of to stay busy. Maybe uh, this is a, a lands on a pay per view somewhere, or it sounds weird. I don't think I ever want to see Prohaska in the Apex, but I think if they threw him in there, it, I think that's the call. If Prohaska ends up on a pay per view next, which he should, because he should never fight in the Apex, it's Jamal Hill. I think if he ends up randomly in the Apex because I got to fill a card, it's going to be like Nikita Krilov or something like that. It's going to be Khalil. MF and Roundtree if it's going to be he's, the Apex. He's got to fit in here somewhere. Roundtree has to fit in here somewhere. Remember, I wanted to see him fight Pereira before Pereira won the title. I thought that would have been so fun. Like, that would have been a great, like, title eliminator fight because Khalil is on such a hot streak. Uh, he's going to factor in. You're right. It, maybe maybe that's where he lands, but we'll see Khalil in a big fight sometime in the next uh, four months, hopefully. You do not want to fight Yuri Prohashka at the Apex. It doesn't go well for you. <laughs> Ask Dominic Reyes. He has just <laughs> never been the same. Just never been the same. But yeah, I mean, there's some interesting matchups there. Yuri versus anybody rules, but Yuri versus Jamal Hill, I think would be super fun, but no wrong way to to do some booking here. Let's go to the former UFC bantamweight champion of the world. His name is Aljamain Sterling. Faces Calvin Cater. I felt really good about betting on Calvin Cater for the watch party because I thought stylistically this is a really good fight for Calvin because he is a very good defensive wrestler. He's also a very good grappler in general which he doesn't really show all that often because he's usually punching people really hard it was just a weird fight because aljo looked real good he looked super strong he was taking calvin down but he wasn't really doing anything with it land some decent shots calvin just kind of looked like and i'm not trying to take anything away from aljamain sterling and i and i honestly don't know if it would have changed anything but calvin looked like he didn't really want to be there after like the first round after especially in the second round when he got taken down in the second round it was just like oh man like this is what we're doing like this is not what i signed up for i want to punch people why are we doing this but good solid showing from aljo he wins uh and then he did deliver a power bomb which i thought was really impressive and almost like with everything else that happened you almost forget it was like that power bomb happened nine years ago with everything else that happened at ufc 300 so Want to know at 145 AK, where does the Funk Master go from here? It's got some options, man. Um, yeah, he did what he had to do. He did what he had to do. Probably not the UFC, probably not Dana White, the matchmaker's favorite fight. Uh, I think we can all agree it was the least entertaining fight in the card, which doesn't mean it was bad. I don't want to call the fight bad. Did draw some boos from the live crowds. The optics aren't good. Um, but again, this was the, you know, the least good fight on a card packed with good to great to amazing fights so aljo did what he had to do he's in a way different weight class caters a pretty big guy uh this probably won't be the last time you guys see sterling grind out a win with his grappling at 145 this is his reality now because he is not standing and banging with some of these uh killers at 145 it's not going to end well for him didn't end well for him at 135 against o'malley frankly so uh get used to it guys you don't have to love it but uh that's how you get extra paychecks how you stay in the ufc and how you keep getting um how you keep getting big spots so with that in mind, I freed this young man up earlier. This could be a really fun grappling matchup and it could give us another top contender, like someone uh, who's like, I don't want to say number one contender, because again, we've kind of named other people who could be getting the shot instead. But I mean, look, if, if, if the winner of this matchup I'm about to propose uh, can't get at least some assurance of a title fight, then they're never going to get it at 145. So give me Aljo and Movsar. Movsar, that's the, the answer. There's yeah, no other option. It's it's There's no other answer. Look, I get it. The Dana White doesn't like Movsar. For some reason, he thought that Arnold Allen fight was boring. I'm pretty sure. I'm really sure he did not watch it because that fight was. Awkward. He doesn't know. Awesome. He didn't know what fight that was. He, <laughs> he didn't know something else. I he for confused sure. it with the Chris Curtis Mark Andre Barry. There you go. Had to. Yeah, yeah. A lot. It gets a lot of questions. Yeah, because you know? uh, that fight was was awesome. And but I get it. Mozart is not a finisher. That is one thing you can't say for sure. Is whether what, what, no matter how you feel about performances, he doesn't finish fights and in the eyes of a lot of fans, unless you're putting on banger fight of the nights every time, if they don't see finishes in your resume, they go like, Oh, this guy's boring, blah, blah, which again, I don't think it's true with most are, but the court of public opinion is a whole other beast. So I don't know if the fight with Sterling would be a barn burner either, but it'd be a very, very, very big name for most are to have. And, uh, if you can say he got a UFC champion, even though it's a different division, uh, get that W on his resume. At that point, he has to be next for whatever uh, happens with Ilya um, after Ilya's next title fight. This is what people need to remember. Mubzar had Arnold Allen badly hurt in that fight. Badly hurt. Um, but it was too bad, like, the way that fight ended. But Mubzar's really good. We'll see what happens. And But I think, yeah, that's the fight. Band, 
chill out. We're good because uh, there's just no other option. And as I said, even after we we said this, if Aljamain Sterling beat Calvin Cater, they weren't giving him a title fight. They were they were doing this exact matchup. This is always this is probably the plan all along. Throw him in there with Movazar, another really really horrific style matchup for you, and we'll see if Aljamain can do it again. Let's go to the UFC bantamweight. AK women's bantamweight is back. I guess never you know, gone. Jed Bishu. never gone. gone. I don't know what uh, you guys are talking about. I've been seeing all this make ban- make women's bantamweight great again. You can't make something great that was already great, like America. All right, that's why I don't understand these slogans. America always great. Women's bantamweight always great. Just she just made it. She just made it greater. That's what I say. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> Kayla Harrison went in there and just just mauled. Holly Holm. This fight was not close. This is not competitive. Why did Holly clinch, Mike? Why? What? What? <laughs> I know. And before anyone in the comments says that's all she does now, I I understand. I have seen many Holly Holm fights. I get it. That is her last seven or eight fights. She is a she is not a distance kickboxer. She's not a she does not use her striking background to like style on people. I I know that. I I understand. She likes clinching, neutralizing against the fence, getting takedowns, uh, mixing and striking when she has to. But I get it. But this is the one fight where you would think they would deviate from what has become her typical game plan and instead initiates a clinch and shocker gets thrown right on her ass. <laughs> Such weird. There, there's very there's some very strange game plans. Jamal, <laughs> I thought Jamal Hill's game plan was a little was a little strange. Mm-hmm. I can't I can't I can't lie to you. I thought he was gonna try to prove a point standing and striking, but I thought it was gonna be a chaos merchant. That is not what happened. He decided to have a, a range kickboxing match with Alex Pereira. Uh, and then this happened. Holly Holm clinches with Kayla Harrison. And then the worst thing that could have happened was that she reverse swept Kayla and got on top for a second. And then I think, <laughs> I think she might have thought to herself, you know what? Maybe I can grapple with her. Maybe I'm better. Maybe I'm the better grappler here. And boy, did not work out well. Holly Holm went on Instagram and was like, yeah, I didn't listen to my team at all. I worked for 10 weeks with a completely different game plan. <laughs> Makes sense. I, I believe her. I believe oh her. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I but this is the best result that could have happened. Kayla just kind of beat the hell out of Holly Holm. The way Kayla handled herself all week I thought was great. This is how you sell a fight. This is how you do it. You put your opponent over. Even if you feel like you're going to smash them, you don't come out and say, this guy sucks at fighting. It's going to be an easy fight. You say, I'm fighting a legend of the sport. Treat her as such. Treat her as such on the way out after you do it. And then you lay the groundwork for what's supposed to happen. So a lot of people have hit me up and they said, look, I know it's going to hurt her feelings, but Juliana Pena just lost the title fight. She just lost it. We're going to do Kayla Harrison versus Rocky Pennington. And I say, no, I say no to that. I say, no. Kayla Harrison actually laid it out perfectly in her post-fight interview. She said, I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's Rocky. I don't care if it's Juliana. I'm fighting for the belt next. So I think what Kayla is going to do, and I think what she should do after just depleting herself to get to 136, take an extra six months, hang out at the PI, do what you need to do to kind of keep that weight down, make this a little bit easier. You're going to learn some lessons along the way. And you let Raquel Pennington and Juliana Pena do the damn thing. You let them just have it out, and then you get the winner. That's how it works. So you sit cage side. You have the face off at the end. It's the title fight for sure, but let Rocky and Pena fight first, and then she gets the winner. Yeah, that that fight, of course, not booked yet. We assume Rocky and Pena, because Pena is coming off a sort of injury. I assume sometime in the summer we will see that fight put together. Um, but, yeah, that's that's the way to go with it. The, the other option, of course, is we all saw Amanda Nunez's tweet. She kind of tweeted a video of herself watching Kayla Harrison's post-fight speech and being like, like acting like, acting like, oh, she's waiting for, like, I'm waiting for my name to be mentioned. I'm waiting for my name to mention. And then, ah, I can't believe she didn't, she didn't call me up. Now, I, I do think it's a bit of a joke, a bit of a troll on, on Nunez's part. But uh, I think her and her team, there has to be some conversations had about, yeah, it, it, let's say Harrison uh, does as we've mapped out here, Mike, and, and, and wins the title. Sure, man, and you come back. I mean, I'd much rather see them fight at 145. I think having them fight at 135 is just so pointless. But um, yeah, if that's what it takes to get Amanda to come back to say, oh, well, uh, I've taken my time off. I'm enjoying my life, but um, I'm, I've still got a little bit. I still got one more in me and I've wanted to fight Kale all this time. Hey, hey, have at it. Because I think we always felt when Amanda retired uh, that she, there was always, it was a classic MMA retirement. I don't think any of us has ever written off Amanda 
saying like, yep, she's done. No way we'll ever see Amanda Nunes fight again. I think we always thought there's a chance just because there just wasn't much competition for her left. But then, you know, if the stars align and if some talent step up, or in this case, a talent from the PFL comes over and shows that she is the real deal. Yeah, there's there's money to be made here. And also the challenge of it. I think Amanda would like to know or prove that she is that she is better than Kayla because there was so much talk of, of them possibly matching up someday. So um, it's not next. I, again, I just even know the comments that a lot of people mentioning Amanda. It's certainly not next. I'd be shocked if that fight was next. That's maybe 2025. We can talk about that. Let's see Kayla again if she can win that title at 135 first, and then uh, we'll we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it next year. It's 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 it moves to likely uh, further down the road. I think. Okay, so I, I see some people saying that you know Kayla's ca called out Amanda. She did not call out Amanda at all. No, no, she did not Ex call expressly out. did not. That is why that was what Amanda yeah. News whole video was about. Yeah. Her whole she video was not. About. She did not. Yeah. Did she, she say answered something questions backstage? She oh, she was questions. asked. Okay. Okay. She was asked. Yeah. Cause she was like, I thought she was happily retired. So I, I didn't even bring that up as an option. I think Chris mm -hmm. Cyborg was brought up as, as well for some reason, even though she has no chance of fighting the UFC, at least right now, cause she's under contract, but yeah. So let me ask you this. AK. Let's just say, let's say Amanda Nunes called Dana White last night and said, I want to fight her right now. What do you do? Do you. Do you say no? Let's see if Kayla wins the belt, or do you just say, "Look, this could be the co-main event for International Fight Week: Connor Michael Chandler, and we could do Amanda Nunes versus Kayla Harris, and you could do the stupid, you know, another BMF title or whatever." I don't give a shit. <laughs> the women's like, BMF. And just do it at forty-five because, like, none of that really matters if we're being honest. It's just two <laughs> women fighting each other. Do you risk it and do it now, or do you doesn't need to have the belt? first because it seems like amanda if you called her and gave her like the right price because i think even kayla told because she did the media car wash after the win that she would she would take nunez over a title fight right now mm -hmm. if she was given mm -hmm. the choice mm -hmm. i i think you can have it both uh, nunez technically is still holding on to the featherweight title as far as i know i mean i get it when she retired <laughs> oh, presumably, presumably both no, were that division can't happen there's Listen, no ufc featherweight title both anymore. both That's titles over. i get it when she retired i think were officially vacated i don't i'm not sure and we know of course bantamweight had to be vacated because Raquel and uh, Mario bueno silva just fought for it but featherweight no one has fought for that title since in my mind i don't care what officially or it's a again belts or props people i say this all the time that belt is still amanda nunez's so you could just do it at 145 and say, oh, yeah, this is either – this is the one – Nunez defending her 145-pound belt if she wants to add to that legacy, add another title defense, or just say the one a 145-pound belt that will probably never be defended again is up for grabs. I don't know. But you can have it both ways. You can have it both ways. You mentioned the women's BMF possibility. I don't even think they need to do that. I think they actually could just pull out the featherweight title. Um, I'm just really curious to see how, if – Let's keep in mind, Kayla has not even made 135 yet. So we have to keep this in mind. She made 136, which I know people are thinking, well, close enough. Obviously, she made 145. Listen, she said herself that one pound between 137 and 136, that one last pound she needed to make the uh, limit for a non-title bantamweight fight because you get that one pound allowance. She said that one pound was like a Herculean effort to make. And because prior to this, she had never weighed lighter than 145.9. She fought once at featherweight. I think she can 135. Like you said, Mike, in a perfect world, she waits for the Raquel and um, Juliana fight, refines her weight cut, bring, brings her body like to a proper place where it's not such an extreme cut. Like she has time to do that now, changes diet, changes training, all that stuff to actually really change her body, uh, which she's already in the process of doing. I think people saw her this week. She looked unbelievable uh, hovering around 135. Um, but... But if the Nunes fight is going to happen, I would really like, just like it to happen at 145. And we can revisit this whole 135 thing again, but we'll see. Um, 145 for me, please. And uh, Nunes, still her title, as far as, I, as far as I can tell. Let's move on to another rising star. His name is Diego Lopez, takes on Sadiq Youssef. And he just ran over Super Sadiq. You don't see Super Sadiq getting just done up like that Diego Lopez people loved him he was a big star all week everybody loves him everyone was cheering for him it's gonna be real interesting to see where he goes he's going to be a ranked featherweight come Tuesday where are we going AK where are we going with young Diego Lopez big hat tips Damon Martin he suggested this in our slack I love the idea of Diego and Yair Rodriguez at the sphere I think that's such a good I think 
they could sell the fight so well. Um, I think it's an exciting match on paper. I think Yair is at this stage where he has to fight up and coming contenders. I don't think, and and, and I, he doesn't strike me as the guy and a guy who's just going to sit on the spot. I don't think Yair Rodriguez is a squatter. Um, so you give him a guy like Diego, who's got a ton of buzz behind him. And if you're Yair, hey, this is your chance. Steal this dude's thunder. Remind people why you've been one of the top five best featherweights in the world for the last few years. And if you're Lopez, boy, this gets you one, one gigantic step closer to a title shot if you can beat Yair. So give me Diego Lopez and Yair Rodriguez all the way. Okay, I, I love that idea so much. I love that idea. The band's getting ready to queue up. <laughs> Hang tight, band. Hang tight. Oh, oh. Um, that is the because that is the exact fight to make on the exact date. However, Diego Lopez has a, some other business he's going to take care of first because that is in September. I don't think you could shelve this man for five months. I don't think you can do it. I don't think you can do it. So I thought about this long and hard. And Diego Lopez is going to get a name. He's going to get a name. Uh, he's going to get somebody who has a lot of momentum right now. He's going to get a guy who has been in main events. And he's going to be a guy that was put in a similar position less than a year ago. And it didn't go well for him. His name is Josh Emmett, AK. Mm -hmm. We're going to do Diego Lopez versus Josh yeah. Emmett. I think that fight is ridiculous. We saw Ilya Tapori get in there with Josh Emmett. We saw the sort of fanfare brought to Jacksonville. Some of the, the dignitaries and big celebrities and stars came out to support, support Ilya Teporia in Jacksonville, freaking Florida. Um, I think Josh Emmett's, I think that's the one, man. He's coming off that incredible knockout win over Bryce Mitchell that people are still talking about, which is one of the most scary knockouts you ever see. And I think Diego's grappling kind of matches up with, with Josh, maybe not his actual wrestling, but those two... Both hit very, very hard, and they will swing for the fences. I think that fight is incredibly fun. So let's go ahead and do that. And then if he beats Josh Emmett, then we can go to the spear, and he can fight Yair Rodriguez. I think Josh Emmett has a really good chance of getting either Diego or Aljamain. If I'm his team, I'm getting on the phone at the UFC right now and trying to get one of these two guys who won at UFC 300. I, th I think he can get one of these fights. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go to Money Moicano, AK. Boy, <sighs> this guy. What a what a what a year plus he's having. Goes in there, no one thought he was gonna beat Jalen Turner. Nobody. The odds were, you know, a lot of people thought the odds weren't wide enough. And for a moment, it looks like everybody was right because Jalen Turner lands a piston. Mo Moicano flies across the octagon, and then Jalen Turner's like, "Yeah, man, bet it's over." And Moicano like stood right back up. It was like, "Where where are you going? Why are you leaving?" <laughs> and the referee is like, "Yeah." Where are you going, Jalen? The fight is still happening. This is, out of all the weird things that happened, I feel like this might actually be the weirdest thing that happened. Maybe. Because it just, it was happened so early that we forgot about it. Yeah. But, man, what a bl what a blunder right there. Can I, and then, of course, Bunny Moicano. Oh, you're gonna, are you going to defend this? Right can now? I defend? I might be the only one in the MMA media defending Jalen a little bit. A little, I, I agree with everyone. Obviously, the way the the fight turned out, it was an F up, huge F up. Uh, right. And by the way, and by the way, I picked Moicano to win. I think I almost picked. You it did? I did. I thought he was going to wow, submit. I thought he was going to submit him though, not to only because I think Jalen's grappling is so untested, and also the experience gap. So experience gap, and also Jalen's um, uh, again the grappling being a, a bit untested. I know he's a big guy. I know he can do some stuff on the ground, like those long limbs, but he just doesn't have that level of, of jujitsu, the depth that Moicano has. So I thought Moicano could win with the grappling. He did. Uh, I was very worried when he got uh, knocked down. Cause I did think that the walk-off was maybe going to get rewarded. Good, good. This, uh, Her this was Herb Dean, right? Oh, no, uh, this was, yeah, this is Herb Dean. Yeah. Herb, by the way, I thought did a, we, we slag Herb a lot these days and he has been, I think one of the worst referees of the last few years. He, I thought he did excellent work at UFC 300. Uh, so let's, let's give, uh, yes a round of applause to Herb. Um, he had, he had that, he had a very good night. Um, so my defense of Jalen is this is we often see guys get knocked down and then we kind of like, we get very annoyed when they don't sometimes when they jump into the other person's guard and then like, Oh my gosh, why don't they just make them stand up? So in a way Jalen kind of did that, but his mistakes were one when Moicano was not as hurt as he thought he was. I, like you said, um, yeah, very dramatic looking knockdown. And then Moicano gets right back up. So it was, Oh, it looks so bad. It looks so bad. But again, there, there is a world where 
And we've seen this in a lot of fights where Jalen knocks him down and jumps down to look for ground and pound and gets tied up in guard and gives Moicano uh, and then Moicano, you know, is able to recover or, or I think what most people are thinking, Jalen goes to the ground, throws hammer fist, ground and pound and ends the fight. So I, I understand that that's what people assume is going to happen, but I do think there's a chance that it, it, it accidentally initiates grappling and, um, and it turns out the way it did anyway. But because yeah, especially now that we know that Moicano was not as badly hurt as it looked, right? So that's that's my only defense for it. But yeah, it looked really bad. It looked bad. It looked cocky. It looked like he was trying to game the system a little bit. But uh, uh, fundamentally, I don't think it was the worst thing to to make to kind of make uh, Moicano stand up again just to see how you know how hurt he actually was because he was killing him on the feet, right? The last thing you want to do is go on the ground under any circumstances. But yeah, the way the way he did it. Uh, maybe walking off wasn't wasn't the right. Maybe he should have taken a beat, seen how hurt Moicano was, and then decided from there. I think instantly doing the walk off, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. We know now was uh, just it did not work out, and and he has to take the loss for that. Okay, well said, my best friend. Mm -hmm. And I think if Jalen Turner could see into the future, like five minutes after that fight ended, and heard Hanato Moicano with a microphone, he would realize that he cannot afford to lose and Jalen would have tried to gun in there and finish him. So uh this is very easy pick for me. I know there was it's kind of a two horse race potentially for these for this fight because both guys want it. But I think at this point it's been built up for like nine months now. Both guys seem to want it. I understand if you want to put Moicano in there with a the higher ranked dude, go right ahead. But come on now. Come on. We're sending money Moicano to Manchester. <laughs> they're sending him to Manchester yeah. in July. And they're gonna he's gonna fight Patty Pimblet. Like this is what's gonna happen. This is what's gonna happen. He's gonna be make that money. He's gonna put Patty behind him or at least try to. And plus now we know he can't afford to lose. He can't afford to lose to Patty Pimblet. So let's just go ahead and do that and it's gonna be fun as hell. Uh, this has been the fight to make for a while. I think I'm not sure why it went away from it. Um, did he mention he did not mention Patty at post fight, right? Immediately, he didn't mention them in the post fight, his quite rambling post fight no. interview. Yeah, he was um, talking about uh, a four he can't afford and, to lose and a book that people need to read. Um, <laughs> I, I, I didn't see his post fight scrum or any post fight comments. Did he mention Patty then? I don't know. I, I was so lost by his whole speech. He's yeah. like, I know, look, look at this card. I know I'm not going to get a bonus, so I'm just going to make sure I don't get a bonus. I'm going to drop 7,000 <laughs> F-bombs right now. <laughs> I uh, That's my one th concern is I, I don't know if he how badly he wants it anymore. Though maybe he's doing the reverse psychology thing now. Maybe he's called for it so much and didn't get it. Now he's like, maybe if I don't mention it, now I'm going to get it. Um, but then someone else called for it on the card. So um, Max Rapkin reminding me, Ludwig von... Mises, thank you. I'm probably mispronounced that. Apologies to Ludwig, the author. Um, so I went away from that. I also didn't pick it for Bobby Green, so I don't know where I'm going with uh, where I'm going with Patty the next time, whenever that comes up. Um, we don't have to match for make for him on this episode. So, uh, I, and actually, it's weird. I like the Moicano matchup for Pat. I actually like the Moicano matchup better than the Bobby Green matchup because I think in a in a weird kind of scrappy grappling fight, even though I know I just said Moicano's like on another level of grappling than a lot of 155ers. I think there's a way Patty can kind of trick his way to a, to a win on the ground there. I don't like Patty's stand-up chance against Bobby Green. We'll talk about that uh, later. Um, so I'm going with, uh, for Moicano, a much higher ranking opponent. I, I want to see him fight Gamrod. I thought this fight had been booked or something. It just, in my mind, I was like, have I not heard of this fight before? Maybe it's been recommended on Otno. Like, I thought, like, this had been booked and it fell through. I would love to see they train together? Fight. Do they? People in the comments I mean, tell me. Did I, just, did I just drop some massive doo-doo? But yeah, uh -huh. you know what? Even if they do, if it is ATT, yeah, well, I know Moicano trains there. Yeah, Cameron does too, right? Uh, so if I drop some doo-doo, I apologize. But I do think it, that is such a big camp. I stand by it. I still think, uh, we just still have, I just talked about Amanda and uh, Kayla. And Amanda, is she's, uh, is Kayla, st Kayla, yeah, Kayla's still with, with uh, ATT. So that's a big camp. If the fights are big enough, people will do it, especially if there's title implications on the line. And I do think a Gamrot Moicano fight could have some inkling of that. So I think they would do it. I think it's a big camp. So I have no problem matching up. I'll say it right now. And I'll say this to listeners unless we know that they're close friends and training partners who we frequently see working together at American Top Team. Uh, and it's very clear they would never fight each other. I will, I am lifting the doo doo uh label on matching up american top team fighters against one another mike i just i just i'm putting it on the table i won't make the decision unilaterally without you but let's let's you know let's put it out there we can we'll do a vote uh off, off camera i mean armin sergeant called 
the fight does support it. So. Sure. There you go. There you go. It happens. AT- Andre Olofsky has fought like multiple teammates from ATT mm-hmm. over the years. So uh, shout out to Achilles Jr. Appreciate yeah. the kind words. Surprised Justin didn't retire. Appreciate all the great content. Uh, Terrence, wise man and cyborg hating from outside the club. <laughs> Stay retired and in PFL. Kayla versus the winner for the belt. Jong versus Tatiana. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to get to the wild card round in a matter of moments. You got three more fights to do. I'm just going to knock the Bobby Green one out right now because I know we're going to talk about the lightweight division. This is a tough one. I'm giving him Benny Darius, AK. That's what I'm giving him. Let's see what he can do. Let's give him a, another Wiley veteran. Let's go in there and, and, and see if Darius can get it back. Let's go ahead and do that. It's fun as hell. Uh, I went with uh, Benoit Sunday. I just want to keep testing Benoit. I get it. We're going from experience to experience. That's a, that's a tough. That's a, I know it's a tough to ask for BSD. But also, I think talent wise, I think he'll still it's be a tough favorite. ask for BSD. I think it is just because listen, no, I'm I, not saying Bobby's bad, yeah, but Jesus yeah. Christ, man, Bobby Green like has to fight Jalen Turner on super short on short notice and gets a win over Jim Miller. And like, we know what the UFC and like everybody was hoping for him. Bobby spoiled the party. And it's like, congratulations on a great listen, performance, man. Got to go Bo- fight Benoit Santanino. Bobby's, a, listen, Bobby's about that life. All right. He, he fought Islam on like what a week's notice or something or two weeks notice. Oh, the yeah, guy's crazy. The guy it. doesn't care. He'll definitely take it. And, and BSD has a top 10 spot. And you know Bobby would yeah. love to take that. And, and I think if you do UFC, again, this is a good gauge for BSD. Possibly a bounce back fight. I think I think Saint Denis would be pretty favored. But again, like the Poirier fight, experience is a hell of a thing. And when you're a guy like Saint Denis, as talented and as insanely tough as he is, when you've only been fighting pro for five or six years, these Dustin Poirier's, these Bobby Greens are real tests. So I I would love to see that fight. Um, are, did we skip over just gone, Josh? We're going back. We're going back. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. You, I forgot. You're taking us on a journey. You're taking us on a journey. Okay. Yeah, we're going back. Yeah, so I have Green versus Dariush. Uh, you have Green versus BSD. Yeah. I kind of like the Dan Hooker Benoit Santini fight, if I'm being honest. That's the one I would do, but doesn't matter. It's lightweight, lightweight freaking rules. Uh, Jessica Andrade beats Marina Rodriguez. Fun fight. We're, I mean, we're an hour and seven minutes into this, so I'm just going to go ahead and say it, AK. I'm going back to the well. I've been going back to the well forever. It's time. Jessica Andrade versus Rosanami Yunus three is what we're going with here because I. Man and Fioro beating Aaron Blanchfield kind of screwed the pooch a little bit. Doesn't seem like Macy Barber really wants to fight Rose Namunis right now. Seems like she wants to either fight for the belt or fight Manon. So let's just do Andrade versus Rose three. I don't give a shit what weight class it's at. Oh, okay. It does not matter to me. It could be 15, 25, does not matter. Let's go. That's I, I, I assume she was, I, I assume when you said that, that she was go- chasing Rose up to 125, which I, which I think I'd prefer just again. And it's just fine. Avoid I'd be fine with that. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and at least you could sell it as being a little different. And it's like, Oh, the first two fights they fought at straw weight. How will they look at flyweight again? Probably the same, but yeah, that's a great, that's a great pick, Mike. Um, I'm just keeping it straw weight, keeping it 115 as I always do. And I think I had to follow this up. I think last time, Vierna Janjaroba fight, I said, give her the winner of this fight. So my match is made for me. I'm going Jessica Andrade and, and Vierna. It's a good fight. Shit, that might actually be the correct answer. Mm. But I'm, I'm holding out hope. Holding out hope. We got to see Andrade versus Rose 3. You have to see it. All right. Figgy. Figgy Smalls. Figgy, Figgy, Figgy. Open the see? card. Open the card. This cards. is crazy. Just this goes so out there crazy. and just lets Cody. Man. He, Figgy treated the fight like Yuri treated Alexander Rakic. Like he just <laughs> he just walked forward, let Cody do whatever he wanted with his hands down, and just smiled at him the whole time. And then knew eventually he's just gonna take him down and and choke him and strangle mm-hmm. him. That's exactly what he did. Uh, so the Cody Garbrandt, I'm about to go back and make a title run thing. I think is officially over. Uh, still a name, still a, a a very valuable piece to this division, but. Figgy Smalls just spoils the party and 2-0 now at 135. Wins over Rob Font and now win over Cody Garbrandt. Where do we go here, AK? I think he said he was moving on from this, but Davison, I, I don't think you can move on from it. I don't think it's up to you. I think this is a fight that people want to see. I think it's a lot fight we all want to see when we heard Figgy was moving up to 135. It made sense when this guy was in kind of a slump. It makes even more sense now that he's gotten off the schneid. I think we've got to go Davison, Figueredo, and Piotr Jan. So that is the correct answer. The problem is Jan is dinged up real bad mm, after mm. that fight. Um, surgeries. We don't know how long he's going to be out for. He could be out for like an entire year. I love that fight. I'm going with Davis Figueredo versus the man who just fought for the Bantamweight title. 
little figgy smalls versus marlin cheeto oh that, uh, that's good that's spicy it is spicy that's I crazy like that fight. we could get I really like that fight we could get so many banger fights like you know, this is the beauty of usd 100 amazing card top to bottom and super enjoyable night the storylines coming out of it and the matchups that we could get out of the, some of the results from the hundred are just so like this sets this could set the table and create so many intriguing matchups for the next year like we could be we like by this time uh, uh next april mike we could be talking about man that like such and such fighters career really turned around and they got these two big fights off of what happened at 300 they got the title fight off of 300 um this person's legacy was changed but what they did at 300 and yeah, just just some of the matchups we've even suggested and just thought about today. It really shows you the depth of this card and um, how meaningful some of these fights were. So, ah, man, I'm, I'm buzzing. People still buzzing, guys. It's Sunday night when we're recording this, and I am still buzzing. We are like 24 hours away from the, the start <laughs> the start of UFC 300, and I'm still like, I think Monday morning I'm going to wake up and still be buzzing. It was a great time. Guys, in the comments, was that the best card you've ever seen, guys? Just sh 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 shout it out in the comments. That's the best card you've ever seen. I know recency bias, but I'm not going to put up a poll, just informal here. And I'm just uh, let your let your voice be heard because, man, I'm I'm just that was great. It's a great time. We opened with Davidson Figueroa and Cody Garbrandt. That was once wow. scheduled to be a, a a once upon a lifetime ago a flyweight title fight. Uh, I think that was going to headline a pay per view card like three years ago or something. And now we still got it, and we got a, the first preliminary bout on a pay per view. Great, great spectacular structure of this card, but and, and and that was a perfect spot for it too. This this card was structured beautifully. It should have been the first fight on the main card, if we're being honest. Sure, that could was have been always should have been, but this is still like a really good one because you knew someone was going to get finished in that fight. So mm. I missed the under one and a half by like a minute. Really pissed me off. <laughs> Mike, did you do here? No, there. Did you do wild card picks? No. Okay. Okay. I thought. I thought. I. I thought oh, I didn't do my homework. Card. That's what I thought. I oh, thought no. I didn't do my homework. I thought we were going to grab a couple of the uh, fighters who did. Okay. Good. Sorry, guys. So no wild card picks this time. But even better, I think it means we are. Uh, we're going to go to the peeps. We're going to the peeps. All right. We're oh, going, wait. We're hold going. on, Mike. Hold on. Okay. I got a real quick check the tape. I know we don't normally do check the tapes in these live shows. Don't worry. This one's real quick. This check the For tapes, me? Mike. No, no, no. This check the tapes is is a is a point to the millions and millions of people who did. No, you know I don't know if it is millions anymore. Probably thousands at this point. Who didn't give up on Conor McGregor versus Michael Chandler? Because I, Mike, I saw some people out there. I saw a lot of people clowning for Michael Chandler, saying, "Oh, you're never gonna get this fight." My, oh, Conor's a movie star now. He's never gonna it's like half you. of our website. Yes, listen, this. listen. Yes, Ultimate Fighter Thirty One, loyal Ultimate Fighter Thirty One fans. We stuck in there. We fought. We told people the series Top Thirty One is not over until. Conor McGregor and Michael Chandler step into the case. This has been the longest season of the Ultimate Fighter ever. It has been ongoing this whole time, and it will <laughs> finally be resolved. UFC, was it UFC 303? 303, yep. 303. It will finally be resolved. So my friends, the Legion, the dozens and dozens of hardcore Ultimate Fighter fans out there, this is our moment. You tell your friends. You, we, we told them. We told them Ch Chandler was going to happen. You have to be resolved. Unfinished business. Had to be done. There All right, that's it. Mike. That's it, Mike. That's it. Okay. Um, we'll we'll call it the doo doo if, if it is doo doo is to be had. Uh, let's let's go. I'm gonna start here. This is exact. Okay, so this this is gonna be a popular one, I think. Charles versus Justin too, and hmm. someone had asked earlier about. I'm surprised that Justin didn't retire. Justin has been saying for a long time that he ba he essentially has this. And it was kind of like the last time I talked to Justin, he talked about the, that his maybe he felt like his words were were twisted in a different way, even though Justin kind of said this. But what he meant by saying, like, I probably have like five more fights left in me. What he really meant was like, I have five more th fights that I consider wars left in me. And he mm -hmm. has this little punch card of, OK, that's a war. That's a war. This one's not. So I don't have to punch that ticket. But this one is. Michael Chandler was a fight of the year when he fought Michael Chandler. And everyone's like, holy shit, these guys went to war. And Justin Gaethje was like, nah, that wasn't a war. I don't count that one. But four, three and a half minutes in there with Charles Oliveira is a war for him. And I think, honestly, if I I, I think Justin left that fight after, with Max at a point where I think he's got one more punch card little square left before he gets his free sandwich, if you will. 
And I think if Justin, <laughs> I think if Justin has the choice, because he's not getting a title fight, he's out of the title picture now, unfortunately, because this division is just, he was in there for a while. He was in this spot. He could have fought for the belt. He took this fight instead. He put it all on the line, and I respect the hell out of him for it. Um, but it's just not going to happen at this point. So I think I don't think he's going to go out like that. But I think if just if they call the Justin Gaethje and said, "You want one more fight? Who do you want?" I think he would specifically ask for Charles Oliveira. Oh, he wants that one. I back. think he would specifically ask for that one for, for that. And also, I think he respects Charles so much for. You know, just what Charles brings to the table in the chaos department. He said of all the guys he's fought, Charles hit him harder than anybody else he's ever been in there with. I don't know if he feels that way anymore after Max Holloway did the damn thing, but that was after a five round, just absolute battle. But I love Charles versus Justin too. There's a very real world where that fight can happen. And there's a very real world where that fight could happen. And it could be the last fight for Justin Gaethje. I have no insight to this, but this is just kind of, through multiple conversations I had with him over the years, this would seem like a perfect kind of let's go on and try to be a pro golfer. I don't have much to give left to give to the sport. And he doesn't, this guy's given us everything. Uh, so yeah, I love that idea. That's very good. That's very good. Uh, I'm, I was just looking to they, two years ago we're, we're, we're approaching. It'll be almost two years ago. Come may that, um, we had that first very memorable fight between Justin and Charles Oliveira. Uh, both men have fought three fights since, three big fights too, three big hard fights since. So maybe the timing is right. That is pretty good. That is pretty good. I, I like that suggestion. Mike, can I read this comment from Billy Tang uh, asking the yes. way they the way they announced the uh, Connor uh, Chandler fight? Scribble no hands data, no package or anything. That and also the Strickland Costa fight and the uh, Islam Tapori fight. This isn't the first time they've done this. Uh, we've had this recently where they just kind of hand Dana a paper or Dana comes up and reads off like two or three big fights at the post fight press conference and just kind of moves on. Um, I think this is intentional. Uh, it's not It's not like, the, uh, I'm just, I'm not sure why. Like, Mike, what's your theory? Do you have a theory as to why um, they've occasionally done this? They have uh, kind of announced just rifled off a bunch of fights at the post fight press conference, very understated way of doing it. Um, not doing it at uh, the fight week press conference. There was a, a rumor, people talking. Why didn't they just do it at the you know uh, uh, the, the presser on, on Thursday? They had the whole big screen set up, and it was just for you know a promo. It wasn't for it wasn't for the Chandler Connor fight. Why, why, Mike? What's the strategy? Like, what do you think? And I'm not, I'm, by the way, I'm not criticizing. This is a genuine question because I think there is some value in um, really again treating your press conferences like news conferences, which is what they are. So I think there is some value in just announcing the fights in a matter of fact way it's certainly like he feels anti-promotional but i'm not like 100 percent against it mike what do you think is the logic why, why why do some why has they why have they done this recently like in the past year or so like just rifle off um big fights uh uh late 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 saturday night i mean dan just like got handed a piece of paper yeah. that was like kind of crumbled up and was just like oh it was like he was seeing it for the first time yeah which is kind of funny um i don't know I mean, I think people expected this this Connor Chandler fight to get announced, but then that's kind of the problem with a lot of these like social media sites is they they throw this stuff out there and the UFC is very well aware of it. And, you know, when Dana says like, look, I can tell you with all honesty, like we don't have mm -hmm. Connor 100 percent locked up yet. You don't think like that is a super believable thing that Dana's saying right there. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. maybe they t they got it done at the 11th hour or something. Sure. I know Chandler is in Vegas as well. Um, so maybe they just wanted to make sure he was on board. And then from what I understand, and I saw a report about this and someone commented on this earlier, Armin Saruki was offered that title fight on June 1st. Hmm. Um, I just talked to somebody who would actually know the answer to this question. And that is true. Uh, Armin was offered the fight. Armin declined because it was six weeks and we kind of knew he was going to decline it. Um, and I have no issue with this for the exact reason I talked about earlier. And then they announced Dustin right after. So I don't even think Dustin like knew this fight got put together like super quick, I guess. And there you go. But it's, I actually think this is a tremendous business decision for Armin Surukian because there's, unless Dustin Sapori just does something absolutely ridiculous, which is at this point, what nothing surprises me in the sport anymore. Like if Dustin Pori goes out and knocks out Islam Makachev and wins the lightweight title, a, what a story that would be, but B, I think that kind of screws Armin Saruki in a little bit. Uh, I think it kind of knocks him out of the picture. Hmm. I feel like Islam is going to win that fight. 
which sets up beautifully for Armin. So why take the fight in six weeks when you could fight him in you could fight him in six months in Abu Dhabi? Like you're just gambling that you think Islam's gonna win. Mm. There's nobody else there. Like you're the guy, and Islam's gonna want to fight in Abu Dhabi, and they'll probably like put that fight together immediately if he goes out and beats Dustin. They'll probably just book that fight that night and say, hey, Islam's going to fight Armin in Abu Dhabi. You yep. know what I mean? So yep. it works out great for Armin. So that – I wonder if, like, he got the piece of paper and it just said the 302 fights and then Dana was just like, I don't know why I dropped the quarter there. <laughs> um, there's someone, wow. like, on my mouse pad wow. and I just picked it up and dropped it like an idiot. UFC, UFC 300. Wow. And I wonder if Dana was just like in a giving mood because it was such a good night of fights that he just was like, screw it. June 29th, Conor McGregor, Michael Chandler. You know what I mean? After announcing yeah. those two other fights. That's how I, how I think this played out. I could you be know, wrong, but that's, you know that's what else? my guess. You know what else also? It also just makes us do the announcement for him, really. You know what? We just, <laughs> like, it makes essentially the, the news sites uh, save, saves Dana some money, right? Saves them a, a promo. I, I, assuming they hadn't put together a promo and or we won't see one soon or uh it saves them yeah because uh, just but just by doing that it puts the onus on us in the media to get that news out there they don't they don't have to do anything like i said he read off a sheet of paper and then suddenly boom goes viral tweets instagrams tiktoks whatever articles of an mma fighting.com there you go we're talking about it on youtube um so maybe that's another reason it's just it's just a very efficient way of getting yeah. the story out there all right let's run through some of these and i gotta go uh gerard hill versus rackets gaethje versus mcgregor post 303 wouldn't hate it would love uh, it oliver love it oliver versus gamrod is fun uh, Nickel versus Robocop, Yuri mm. versus John in Prague return, mm -hmm. Sterling Yair, Lopes versus Lopez versus Ige, Figgy versus Aldo, winner lose. I thought about matching up Figgy with the winner of the that fight, but I don't know. It's I don't think Aldo's I thought about coming it. Back. I, I kind of think Aldo's just gonna do the thing and get Jonathan Martinez, and he's gonna be out of there. He's just finishing his contract. Yeah, he's gonna go box <laughs> and do whatever the hell he wants. Yeah, uh, Tristan. So here's the thing. If AK was like, hey, Tristan just match made a fight. What do you think he match made? I would have picked this one in a second. <laughs> would have picked this one in a second. Marina versus Mackenzie Dern. The rematch. Enough time has passed. We can run it back. Do you have any yeah. interest in watching that fight? I don't think it that was fight good, goes any differently. I know. I don't think it was a really good fight, though. I just, yeah, I don't know if it goes different. It was a really good fight. If it's, you know, that's always a reason enough to, I think, to run something back. I say hey, it was fun the first time. Um, not terrible, but yeah, I. If you're McKenzie, I think you, you you'd be into. It. I think you you'd want to try and get that uh, get that one back. But and if you're Marina, I mean McKenzie's got a lot of star power still. So yeah, it's not. It, there's there's a logic behind it. Uh, did you see Joey Miller's super chat, Mike? Uh, let me see. Yeah, just I'm pointing. Da, 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 we can pull that. Da, da, got, we some, go. got some. There we go. Ah, uh, sorry, man. Uh, Joey Miller, baseball player, Shara Bullet versus <laughs> Bo. I believe Shara is, is Shara booked. He's booked. I think he is. I'll check real quick. So he's fighting inside. Oh, he's. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a second. I think he was booked, but now he might not be booked. He. Oh, that's right. All right. So they booked. Oh, yeah. Shadi he's against Ihor e -er. e Potieria. But now Ihor e Potieria is fighting. Michelle Padilla? He fighting? He's fighting Michelle. Michelle. Yeah, yeah. As stepping as a replacement. At yeah. 301. Yeah. So. Maybe, maybe, but they're not gonna. There's no freaking way. They that's tough. That's a bow in there with that fucking dude. That's a tough fight for Bo, man. <laughs> yeah, no way. Uh, I mean, I'd watch the hell out of it. Alger versus Ortega, Chepe Marisol versus Super Sodic at the Sphere. But don't yeah. hate that. Chepe's look damn good. Roundtree versus Rakic, Dubronx versus Gamrot, or Fazeev. Thanks for everything. There you go. Thank you, Shout Joey. Joey Miller. Yeah, good picks, man. You, good my picks. man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, let's keep going here. Scroll through this. Iron Turtle versus Bo. I knew this was gonna come. I the Iron Turtle Army. Pick. Mike, the Iron Turtle Army does not sleep. They are if they see a middleweight who they want to see tested, they are putting uh, they're putting the iron turtle in there. So uh is it maybe a too cool for school thing? Like we're so big time, we make all the big fights and here's some news. This is just it's what they do now. They want to control the narrative, they want to announce all the fights. That's it. That's it. The reason that this took so long is because the UFC and this again, I don't have a ton of insight. This is just kind of how I feel about it. The UFC was mad that Conor McGregor announced the fight on December 31st that it was having June 29th. And he was right the whole time, apparently. So, <laughs> but that's just kind of how it works. 
He never lies. Never lies that Connor. Uh, better KO with all uh, circumstances uh, considered Max Holloway last night or Leon head kicking Usman. I just had oh this God. discussion with a, with a friend of mine. Shout out, shout outs, Nick, shout outs, Nick just had a discussion with a friend of mine. He, um, he favors the Usman, uh, the, excuse me, Leon Edwards, Usman knockout headshot dead. Uh, and, 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 and I can agree in the sense that there is greater stakes. It was for an actual undisputed title, not the very, not the lovable, but not official, um, BMF title. Uh, Leon was losing, of course, much more importantly, Leon needed that knockout, right? That was, that was a, the Hail Mary shot of all Hail Mary shots. Uh, argu- not arguably, I think, I think he was fighting a guy who at the time was certainly viewed as more, uh, indomitable. Um, Max was the underdog in this fight, but I mean, it wasn't so crazy to imagine him beating, uh, Gaethje. Uh, Leon was a pretty strong underdog against Kamaru. And again, Kamaru was just in this this massive run. Kamaru considered one of the top three greatest welterweights of all time. Gaethje doesn't have that level of esteem. So the stakes and the history behind the Leon knockout are greater. And again, it's hard to shake off recency bias. But for me, I would put the Holloway thing. It's just the moment was so magical. It was so, as, as with the Leon head kick, but it was magical in just this way where it was so kind of unnecessary to... We just the fight was going to end, and we were still going to talk about it as one of the best fights of the year. Like just based on the action we saw, it was an awesome fight. And for Max, and yes, to some degree, Justin, to give us that moment that only they could deliver, uh, it, it's it's making me emotional. Just like thinking about it, it was so beautiful. So both are great. There's no wrong answer. I'm going with the one I just saw recently, so it's a little bit unfair to the Leon knockout. But give me the the Max Justin as a. Uh, the best knockout of the last whatever i don't know 10 years that was 10 15 all time i don't know that man such a good question i mean stakes and all it's i mean it's leon for sure but when we look back on crazy ass knockouts we're gonna remember max always first there's just no doubt about it that's gonna be the one that's gonna be ranked higher in terms of if people were voted on it they would vote for max Holloway. it's just the, it's just the way it is because it was just so wild and insane. Like, the, everything about that fight was insane. So, that's how I feel. It's kind of like... It's kind of like th- trying to compare 300 to 200 and 100. You know what I mean? Like, 100 and 200 had the star power. Leon Edwards' knockout was, like, the 300. Like, really, really good. And, like, what a cool moment. But Max Holloway's knocking out Justin Gaethje is like Brock Lesnar fighting Frank Mir. It's just star power. It's just viral moment. All of that. You know what I mean? So... Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, good comment here. I just want to read Lazy Bad saying it's opposite scenarios. One was desperation. One was a declaration. I am stealing that's that. Good one. Lazy Bad, I was, I'm, I'm stealing that. And uh, you better clip this. Otherwise, you will not get credit for it. So call me out if I use that in a future show and I, <laughs> I don't credit you. Joey likes Jalen Turner versus Fazeev. I don't yeah. hate that. Yeah. Um, I mean, Fazeev's coming off of a super close fight with Justin Gagey that a lot of people thought he won. And then, well, no, he fought Gamrod, and like that fight never got going because he got hurt. Mm. I know what you mean. But, His last actual like fight where we got to see him like compete. Yeah. Uh, Lazy bed nickel versus Wyman in the fight to make all American wrestling generation face off. I don't hate this. <sighs> not idea, yet. But not Bo yet. Nickel, not yet. Bo Nickel has no interest in this fight. He talked about okay. it. Last okay. Night. Good. I. I don't uh, will take two more. Uh, what's next for Jamal Hill? Take time off, fully heal, get back to it. Who should he fight next? I say Yuri Prohashka. Yeah, I, I, that's yeah. You, your your Yuri pick, I think, was really strong. Um, I just I didn't have anything in mind for Jamal. I, I I've been very critical of Jamal in the past, based on you know again some comments he's made on social media about certain topics. Um, uh, just the way he carries himself on social media, his, his personality it, it runs me the wrong way. And this is personal. I know some people are big Jamal Hill fans. I know some people have a ton of respect for him for the win over to share. That's fine. I, I think he's a very talented fighter. So I probably just didn't put a lot of thought into what's next for him. I, I just would like to see him. Um, and again, I don't know Jamal personally. So I, so for me to say stuff like, oh, he should, he should focus more on fighting and less on social media and he's a blah, blah. Like, I don't know the guy personally. This the, the his the way he acts. Maybe this is what makes him, you know, the best version of himself. Maybe this is why he's as good as he is, right? So for me to criticize his how he handles his um his public persona, or whatever, it's, it's a bit silly, I, and and so I can't really do that. But I do feel like some changes need to be made. I think maybe he got a little bit uh, over his skates, as it were, as far as like saying like, oh, I know I'm. It's one thing to be confident. It's another thing to be so arrogant and say like, I'm going to stand up with Pedetta. I'm just going to like crush him. Like there has to be some 
line between that kind of overconfidence uh, and also like you know believing in yourself there has to be there has to be a middle ground somewhere in there so i think jamal has still has all the makings of a guy who could fight for the title someday who could win the title someday so i don't know what's next i i just would like to see a bit of a tweak in um how he promotes the fight business but hey what do i know pretty pretty uh ta well talked about fighter uh again guy who's already has a ufc title under his belt don't take your advice from me jamal this is just a a um you know, media member spouting off, I guess. Well, I mean, we knew when he started approaching the fight the way that he did that he put all this extra pressure on himself. Sure. Almost like he had every made, made himself the guy with the most to lose on the yes. entire card. Yes. Um, Cause he's going to get, he's going to get ripped for this for, for quite some time. And maybe there's a part of him that doesn't give a shit. Yeah. I'm curious to see how Jamal Hill does handle this. Is he just gonna, I thought it was just kind of humble last night. It just, Hey man, got caught. Grats, Alex, I'll be back. Like, good way to look at it. But if we start hearing interviews of him saying, like, nah, I wasn't healed or and all that stuff, like, you can't – it got to a point where you can't turn back. You just have to keep going with it, and that's really where he's at right now. But I will say this about Jamal Hill. I think – I thought he was the MVP of fight week. I really did. I thought everything he did was great in selling this fight, making it much more interesting because – when this fight was first announced, I thought exactly what, ha what happened last night was going to happen. That I was just going to yeah. hit him once and it was going to be over. Um, it just seemed like this is where we were going. But Jamal Hill, like, actually got people on his side. He got people being like, you know what? Like, after what Ilya Tapori just did, maybe he can do this. And I thought what he did for that fight all week long was huge. Yeah. It really was. And... And, and and I'll agree with you because Alex Pereira, don't get me wrong, he has a mystique about him. He has a brand of cool that people really like. That brand of cool uh, works even better when you have an opponent who is kind of a hothead, who's kind of a loudmouth, who kind of talks a lot. Then your coolness is like pronounced. So it can it can work in other scenarios too. But like, let's say the fight with Yudi. Uh, again, great fight, but the build to it, I don't think it was particularly memorable. You have two guys again who are very intense, but they have a brand of intensity that like I don't think it necessarily amplifies each other but when you bring in again a jamal hill who's going to talk a lot who's going to kind of poke at you who's going to jab at you verbally then you being cool and stoic and uh having that menacing walkout on fight night it just seems so much better and and, and same, same with yuri because his brand of weirdness was uh worked best with rakic you know ahead of 300 rakic is whole like what you're not a samurai what are you talking about this is weird you're just being weird and that made for great for great uh dynamics so um I, certain opponents just bring out the best in other personalities. I think that's what Jamal did. I think that's what Rakic did. So I think you're right, Mike. I think, again, love love Jamal or hate him. Um, he did uh, some pretty solid promotional work this week. For sure. Yeah. All right. I think we're done here. Uh, I got to go to bed. I haven't yes. slept in like yeah. <laughs> Mike, you have been hours. up for a long time. Again, you were – people, please, if you didn't get a chance, get go it. Go back and watch the watch party. It is archived time on – Timestamps. Timestamps are there. See They're the, the best reactions. Comments. Him and GC dressed to the nines, uh, Vegas style. So uh, oh, great work, yeah, Mike. Great Apparently, work. that looks Andy like State. a uh, a Secret Service agent. I'm seeing or a lot of federal agents. <laughs> that was the uh, reaction I saw the most, <laughs> which is pretty wild. Um, I'm just looking at the MMA hour lineup. I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> Ooh, such I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it's going to be uh, a good one. And it's we're not looking. Good one. And we're not looking at next week's lineup either. We can't tell that because there isn't one. Mike. Oh God. Can I just say, like, this might have been the best thing the UFC did, was they left this <laughs> this next week open. Little break, yes. Little break. Oh, we need this so badly. We need this so badly. So um, we might do a BTL on Tuesday just to kind of react to all of this, but I'm taking – I'm off. I'm actually basically on vacation Good. right now. Like, Good. I should be – I'm off. You should not be week. working right now. Yeah, you are on vacation hours. But we got Mike PFL 3 Friday. This is – welterweights and what are we what's on this card <laughs> welterweights no and featherweights welterweights and featherweights so okay, there will so be there will be fist fights be MMA. Ryan, yeah. ryan garcia fight Devin ryan Haney garcia let's this week. let's hope that fight happens uh if anyone's been following some of ryan's social media activity it's uh it's it's he's been active on social media how about that let's just leave it there i got to see ryan garcia like 15 feet away from me how do you look uh, insane sane he just showed up to the Diaz Mazadal presser and did like a six sixty second press conference scrum with Brian Campbell. Shout out to BC, uh, who did a great job there. I didn't even know he was doing it, and I got to got to see the man in person, which was nice. 
Um, yeah, he just went up and cut a promo. Someone said Oscar De La Hoya sucks or F Oscar De La Hoya. And he said, yeah, it's kind of funny. And they did a funny dance on the way off stage. And that was it. We saw him for 60 seconds. And he all right. beat it. It Great. was pretty fun. Garcia Haney. Uh, all right. Check it out. Yeah. But thank you all. Appreciate you. Uh, and May Hour to react to all this stuff going down tomorrow. It'll be another show on Wednesday. And we're going to try to get a BTL in on Tuesday. Otherwise, we'll be back next week. So thank you all very much. For AK, I am Mike Heck. Always remember, don't take this stuff too seriously. I'm supposed to be fun. And I hope we can have more fun like we did last night watching UFC 300. Thanks for watching, everybody. We're out of here. <laughs>